Welcome to BAFTA and this special session with our nominated screenwriters. My name is Hannah Patterson, and I would like to welcome to the stage, first of all, David, David Rabinowitz and Charlie Wachtel, who are up for Black Klansman. Thank you. Will Fetters, who is nominated for A Star is Born. And then we have Deborah Davis and Tony McNamara, who are nominated for The Favourite. David and Charlie, I'd like to start with you, please, and Black Klansman, and if you could tell us a little bit about um, the origins of this project and how you came to hear about the story and the book, which you, you I believe, bought the rights to yourself. Well, we actually never got the rights to the book, which was uh, very scary for us because we, we knew that we could, be, could have been cut out of the process at any given point. Um, so... The way it came about, the genesis of it all, uh, started with Facebook, actually. Um, David and I had written a pilot together. That was the only thing we had done together. And the next thing was Black Klansman. Um, so we, were, we had our, our eyes peeled for, for the next big idea. And somebody, an estranged uh, student from my high school, had posted a story about the Black Klansman. And we read it. And I sent it to Dave. Dave read it, and there was a link to the book on Kindle. And we both read the book, and we thought to ourselves, this has got to be set up somewhere already. Why isn't this a movie? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, It wasn't in bookstores. It was like a small independent publisher. So we just reached out, and we got in contact with Ron Stallworth, and we basically just asked Ron for permission to adapt his memoir into a script on spec. And uh, Ron agreed. And so it was just me, Charlie, and Ron, at first, just developing a script, and we sent him like, every draft of everything, and we got notes on like every single wow. page. Wow. And so, wh when you'd finished the draft, how did you decide what to do with it next? Charlie, uh, being an assistant uh, in Hollywood, knew some producers. He knew this producer named Sean Reddick, and he, uh, he just basically gave him an elevator pitch. And Sean brought us in to pitch it, and uh, while we were writing it, and Sean was like, hey, we're in the early stages of pre-production pre on this thing called Get Out with Jordan Peele. Jordan might be interested. So, Because uh, at the time, we had uh, Jordan in mind to play the, ro uh, the lead role. Okay. They had asked us, and so that's how his name came up. A couple months later, we had a draft into uh, the producers, and they gave it to Jordan. Jordan read it and came on as a producer. And then, uh, you know what happened with Get Out? Yeah, <laughs> we do. <laughs> uh, once Get Out came out in uh, February of 2017, um, everything just blew up. Uh, Jordan could basically do anything. Do what he wanted. Yeah, yeah. and so Jordan brought the script to, to Spike. Okay, and so when Spike became involved, did uh, you then do several, did you work on drafts with him? Or did he then do some writing on, on his own? Or how did, how did that process work? Once Spike got involved, we just sort of handed the baton off to him okay. and uh, Kevin Wilmot as well. Yeah. Yeah. Spike said, I, you know, I have my writing partner, Kevin Wilmot. Mm -hmm. We want to do a pass on the script. So uh, it was me in my kitchen preparing a file to send to Spike Lee. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've never been so self-conscious about a computer file in my <laughs> life. Um, and then, yeah, when we sent it off. And then the next thing we knew, there was a shooting script. And how did it work for you originally? Because it's got such a specific tone, the film, the mix of humor with some satire, but also the thriller elements. Was that something you two had worked on yourselves with those early drafts? How conscious were you about the, who the audience was for this film? Sure, yeah. Um, I think initially we sought out to just make a popcorn movie. Okay. You know, we wanted this to be something that could be commercial, commercially accessible to a large audience. It was a, an, we wrote it as an undercover thriller period mm -hmm. piece with absurd elements um, because there's absurdity uh, organic to the premise. Uh, it's also a high concept, weirdly, mm -hmm. story, uh, even though it's also based on a true story. Um, so what Spike and Kevin did, what we, what we started to do and what Spike and Kevin really did was keep all those elements but then add uh, the relevance to today's to headlines. Today, so that it resonated with Black Lives Matter and everything that's exactly. happening at the moment. 
Great. Perfect, perfect match. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and just as a kind of a last question to you before we, before we move on, I'm interested in that kind of burden that you felt of the sort of truth of the story and when, knowing when to bring in the moments so that we're just going to make it more dramatic. Which bits did you know it was kind of fine to make up but still remain true to the essence of the story? Of course, yeah, you have to do that when you're adapting any true yeah. story. There were two big things initially, uh, making the partner that was eventually played by Adam Driver, making him Jewish, yeah. uh, which was the first big change that we brought to Ron, and Ron was on board. The second thing was literalizing the bomb plot. In the memoir, Ron talks about there was a threat of that these people could carry out bombings, but it never actually materialized. So to give the second act a little bit more of an engine, an objective, the, the investigation having an objective, we literalized the bomb plot. And Ron, to his credit, was completely fine with that. Mm -hmm. um, Will, you, <laughs> the star is born. Is it working? It is working. Um, a different kind of burden of history, in a way, with you, because, because of the, the films that had gone before. And I'm interested in the genesis of your, pro your specific project, how you, how you came to that, and also how you sort of dealt with having the films that had, three films that had already been made on the same theme. Yeah, when I first read, um, I started writing on it nine years ago. And when I first approached it, I didn't even know there had been other movies. Um, it was submitted to me along with a, a book I was trying to get with the same producer, Bill Gerber. And uh, I read it and immediately just resonated with the story. You know, I mean, the idea of, of, um, of, a, of, of a, uh, the, the two things that I felt like looking at it that needed to evolve were, needed, were the things that had evolved with the culture already. So, you know, when you, when you look at the 1954 version in particular, um, it's an amazing movie. Like, Judy Garland and James Mason are phenomenal in it. Um, like really just some staggering other performances, but there's, there's something really dated about it in the sense that like literally in the second act, th his wife working is supposed to be like a tragedy. You know what I mean? And, and culturally it feels like, oh man, this is so sad. Like she's succeeding and he's not. And he gets really bitter and he gets jealous. Um, so when I first read it and I was like, the thing that, that I that ultimately I kind of injected into the the, the draft that I think kind of got the ball rolling again was the idea that fame could not be the destination and that the purity of her expression as an artist ultimately had to be his, his concern. Because, you know, when you get into the, the machinery of any system that, that ex that's existing before you, like, you, you become, you kind of get fed into it. And I, I felt that myself, like, when you first, you guys are going to, I mean, I'm sure you've, you're feeling it now, too. It's like, you, you get opportunities and then people just start, something succeeds and people start sending you anything. And being able to like, you, you, I lost myself in the beginning of my career, just like what it was gravitating towards projects for the wrong reasons. So I knew it could happen to me and so it, it kind of allowed me to find that thing in the story that I could, could, could tie back to my own experience as, a, as an artist um, and then inject it into the, into the narrative. So that was the, a big thing and then yeah, I mean, I, I came on, I wrote a draft, and it's been nine years. Clint Eastwood almost did it. Bradley came on with him, and I don't know. It's all a blur at this point. I'm just glad it worked. <laughs> so, so were you carrying on writing several drafts during that time, or did it depend who was attached to the project? Would you kind of stop when nobody was attached to the project? Yeah, I mean, you know, I wrote, I wrote nobody would pay me, but I, I wrote for, for Clint for free because that's Clint. You just what you do. <laughs> um, so when Clint, was, when Clint came on after I wrote a draft and then... We had like a couple other directors that were loosely attached and took meetings and stuff. And then when Clint came on, it was like, okay, well now we're making a movie. I don't know if it'll be good or not. I don't know, but when Clint shows up, you know it's happening, which was very exciting. Um, so I wrote, I, did, I put some new stuff in for him, but yeah, you know, the draft stayed pretty close to, to what it was when I first came on. And then Bradley, you know, read it for the first time to star for Clint. And then you know, timing wouldn't work out with with some other people and. Ultimately, he, they went and did Sniper together, which at the time I was like, well, that's great for them, you know, but <laughs> karmically it came back around uh, when Bradley, you know, literally finished Sniper and finished the award season, and then that was, you know, he picked up this. That was the next thing he started doing. He just got a call, like, are you available Wednesday? I was like, yeah, and then that was it. And so I'm interested, again, talking about drafts, what then happened when Lady Gaga was attached and you knew you had Bradley, just in terms of dealing with their kind of star personas, because there's a lot of parallels, obviously, in the film 
to Lady Gaga's own career and her kind of rise and how, how much you were referencing that deliberately. For sure, and I, I was not, there were times when I was like, we'd be writing something and I'd be like, have you talked to her about this? You know, <laughs> and I remember one time I was like, I, yeah, I should. You know, I mean, they had, the thing is they were so open with each other from the beginning. And I, and you know, somebody asked me recently, like, when did you know you caught like fire in a bottle with this? And for me, the, the, the first real indicator was when, first of all, they, the, the studio head at the time asked us to do a screen test and Lady Gaga was not only willing to do a screen test, she did it, we did it at her house. And so the idea that she would just like let a bunch of people come into her house and then film her, and uh, that was an amazing day. So Janusz Kaminski shot it, and, and it was just like, we did this thing, and I, the fact that she was committed enough to do that, and then when we started writing after they, they gave us the green light to, that she could be in it, we, we would literally like FaceTime her, and, and she would just tell us stories. I remember going out to her house and just, she was willing to, she had just met me, and I was like, can I just turn a recorder on? And she was okay with that. And she would just talked about her experience like as she came up in the business, and she was so open and so willing to just put her own personal stuff into the, into the story. Um, yeah, I, I still kind of marvel at it, that, that she, after everything she's kind of, you know, the kind of journey she's had to travel to just oh, like, trust some random person who walked into your house. <laughs> and then let us weave all this, own, her own personal like, traumas and stuff into the story. It's, yeah, it's, it's to her credit. And so you did take some of those, so she actually did start to affect it. You could then go oh, away sure. and write. Oh, for sure, yeah, yeah. We had, we had, uh, we had you know, we had, he, he, Bradley always had very specific ideas about, you know, Jack Maine and, and kind of who he was and, and what, the, you know, the trauma in his childhood. And, you know, there was a lot of, we were kind of rabidly honest about, the depression and alcoholism and and that was easy that was easier to i mean it's a very difficult thing to deal with but you know, we we both had experiences with, with that and it's, it was something that we could everybody involved could you know had, i feel like had a place they could go to to to, to kind of some experience with with either of those two things but her character was always the most difficult one to kind of to kind of find and and i yeah stephanie's presence and her ability her, her openness really at least for me helped open that up mm. And aside from updating the, sort of the gender politics, I guess, which, which you just talked about, um, also the interesting theme in there about art versus commerce, which feels sort of very live in there. Um, how much was that something that you were kind of keen to sort of update and bring into the sort of contemporary world? Yeah, that was, that was something that I'm always interested by. I mean, but the reality is, is it's show business. You know, without the business, there's no show. You know, so I think there, there is a line you have to walk. And I think that, you know, to certain, you know, what, what Bradley did on this, I hope more and more people who are in his position in this business will do. Because it's be, everybody's terrified. Nobody knows what's happening. Netflix is now like the thing, not just a thing. So everybody's trying to kind of like, people are on more. The DVD money's gone. And, and so, and studios are like anything else. Like people are just, they're, they're afraid to take chances. And you know, I think success of, 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 of this year, there's been some, some, some good dramas that have made some money. I think it'll help, it'll help. It's amazing how you just start getting submitted like musicals. It's like all of a sudden, this is a great idea. <laughs> nobody, <laughs> nobody thought it was a good idea for the last nine years. Um, but I think that what Bradley did in particular is like he, he had all of these, these chips that he'd accrued, you know, like, that, and, and when he finished American Sniper, the, he could do anything, you know? He could have gone and worked with any director. I can't, I mean, stuff, he would just, any, he was being offered anything. And he wanted to do this. And he had a conviction to do it. And it was not obvious. Doing the fourth remake of A Star Is Born was like not a thing where it was like, oh man, yeah, that's a home run, mm -hmm. you know? So he, I just think about what he was willing to risk himself creatively. Because he, he didn't, you know, he's talked about how he spent four years doing this. He literally didn't do anything else. I mean, I was here in London with him doing, he did The Elephant Man, and we started working here, so it's very cool to be back. Um, and like, it's all he did. He would, I mean, he would do like press, he'd do like one day of press for, for like when, when movies that he'd already done would come out, but he committed everything to this, and, and if it had not worked, I mean, in today's atmosphere with everyone's like collective ADD, like he, he could, he'd lose his, his A-list status, whatever that is, but that risk that he took, I mean, a golden cage is still a cage. You know, being willing to, if he had just kind of pandered to, to audience, his audiences or just done things because 
it just, you know, it, it felt like what other people thought he should do, then, uh, you know, maybe he, I don't know, I just, I can't, I can't, I admire what he did so much, and I hope more people are willing to do it who are in his position. Um, Deborah and Tony, it'd be great to talk about the favourite. So, so Deborah, if you could, because it was um, your, it was this piece of sort of slightly unknown history which, which you came across, I believe. If you could tell us a little bit about that. Yes. Um, I was reading the Evening Standard, as you do, and there was a little bit of a snippet in there, and it said, everybody knows that the Duchess of Marlborough was having an affair with Queen Anne. And I thought, well, I don't know about this. <laughs> and I'd studied history at university, and I kind of all, had always taken a great interest in the queens of England, and I knew nothing about Queen Anne. So I decided to find out about Queen Anne and find out about this supposed relationship. And there's a lot of material that you can find in the London Library, the British Museum, and its primary as well as secondary sources. And what I found was a female triangle. And it was quite an extraordinary story about how the Duchess of Marlborough, who was a childhood friend of Queen Anne, and they were best friends and undoubtedly had a very passionate relationship. All the love letters from Queen Anne are to Sarah, not to her husband. Um, that this relationship was turned upside down when Sarah introduced her young cousin to the royal bedchamber. And there is a, a, a memoir that um, Sarah wrote. She didn't publish it until a few years before she died. But in it, she said that she discovered uh, very late on that Abigail had become the absolute favorite and that she was sort of kicked out of the relationship with Anne by Abigail and that that had political ramifications because Abigail had formed um, a relationship or a, a, an alliance with the Tory leader, Robert Harley. And essentially, Abigail's success led to a shift in the balance of power in politics and led to Marlborough, Sarah's husband, being dismissed having been the most successful general of all time, who was bringing Louis XIV, the Sun King, to his knees, was about to march on Paris. He was dismissed and trumped up charges of embezzlement were made against him so that he and Sarah actually had to leave the country. So this was a very, very big story that pivoted around a female triangle. And that's the story that I came to the conclusion should be a film. And so you wrote, the you wrote a, a draft as a spec script? Absolutely. I wrote the first draft in 1998, and I took it to Cece because I knew Cece through her partner, Dorothy Berwin. I took it to both of them, and at the time, they weren't able to um, help me with it. But um, after I, I used that script to go to the University of East Anglia, to do an MA in script writing, and in the early 2000s, I went back to Cece, who by then had set up her own production company, and she then said she would like to take it on. And from that point on, she was absolutely committed to this film, and it, it, it was a long journey mm. to, to reach this point. And I'm imagining that the, the, there were some issues around the fact it was female-driven, a, a sort of a love triangle between three women. Was that one of the issues around it, it taking so long, do you think? I, that is my understanding. I wasn't the one, thank goodness, you had to go out and market this, but Cece was. And yes, there were issues around it being, um, was it a film that could be financed because it was a three-female lead? Mm. There were issues around the same-sex relations. And yes, for Cece, it was a challenge. Okay. Cut to Tony. Um, when, did you, when did you become involved with this project? Um, I became involved sort of shortly after Yorgos found this amazing story. You know, loved the, this idea, that the story that um, Deborah had found. And, you know, Yorgos has a very distinctive sensibility. And so he was looking for a writer who uh, he felt had the same slightly strange sensibility. So, um, and he read a lot of writers and then eventually he stumbled across this a script I'd written and a play I'd written, which was a period um, 
play and then um, and he had just moved to London he just made dog tooth mm -hmm. but he hadn't made lobster or anything because this was like seven years ago I think and um, we just got you know we got on Skype and we had a very similar you know we were like oh it should be a tragic comedy and it should be and I you know and we talked about how we felt about period movies and I was like when I see people tie their shoes with ribbons I want to put a gun to my head <laughs> so I don't really love period movies and he's sort of the same but he really wanted to make a period movie that felt like we were sort of not reinventing the genre but like doing something different and something very and I think in my play I had very contemporary language in this period piece and he liked that idea and um and so from there we just spent you know he was here I was in Australia so I would write drafts and he would give notes and then I'd come to London for a couple of weeks and we'd sort of wander around and um talk about it and then I'd go back and write more. And in that period over the seven years, he then got the lobster up and went and made the lobster. And then he came back and he was like, I just worked with Rachel and Olivia and I think they're, the, they're two of them, of the three. And um, then we kept going and at that period he started to get, you know, the lobster was a success and he thought, because originally he was like, I don't even know how I'm gonna get the money to make this film because it's a period film, it's expensive. I've made dog tooth, but that was like 400,000 euros or something. Um, but then after Lobster, we were like, oh, maybe we could get it up. And then with those two attached, and then he met Emma. And once we had those three, we, would, we were still a couple of years. And then to his credit, he could have got it up quicker, but he waited 18 months for them all to have a window where we right. worked to get, you know, we knew it was them and we were working on the script with them, them in mind. Did that make a difference for you, knowing who, who was going yeah, to play Yeah, I mean, it roles? did. It sort of did and it didn't because I'd worked so many years on it anyway. But knowing you were confident you had amazing actors who were going to be... So, you know, they're such great actors. So even in rehearsal, I was like, well, that line's really not that funny, but when Emma Stone says it, it seems to really land. <laughs> so, um, so they always make you look better than you are. <laughs> And that's, that's sort of how, yeah, how it worked. And I'm kind of interested in, um, actually with all of your films and, and with The Star is Born as well, this, um, the thing about drawing on historical events to actually kind of smuggle in issues that are very, very relevant today and that a lot of people do seem to be doing this more and more in terms of actually looking to, to period pieces but making them feel really vibrant and really alive and speak to contemporary issues. I'm kind of interested how much you had those discussions with Yorgos? We, well, we didn't really have them at all, and, uh, um, we, other than it should feel contemporary, and the way I approached the characters was always, was we're not looking back at something. Because when we talked about it, we were like, despite the history, everyone knew the, like as Deborah explained, the broad strokes of this story were what they were. But how that happened, and how they got to be, how Abigail, did get in with Anne and how the thing all came apart and their relationship, we didn't really know heaps about that. So, I, yeah. I also worked with Yorgos for two years and I wrote two drafts with him and we did have conversations mm -hmm. about this. Um, and the, the points of principle that we agreed was that this should be very focused on the female triangle and that everything else should come out. Should play secondary to Well, that. or should come out. Come out, okay. And one of the points of principle was that we would never have a scene in which one character, one of the women, wasn't, at least one, wasn't present. Right. So there was, a, a, and that was one of the reasons why I was very excited to work with Yorgos, mm. because our, our script in the years before had gone through various forms as different people became involved mm -hmm. and he was actually the first director who who wanted to play to the strength of the female characters mm -hmm. who wanted to take their vulnerabilities and explore them not hide from them so he was very interested in Anne being a sick woman with many many medical issues he didn't want to pretend that she was well. He didn't want to pretend that she was a beautiful woman. He wanted to focus on their frailties. And that was the strength of the piece. Mm. That, that's what his vision made that piece a very strong exercise in female relationships. And what's fascinating, which is coming up with all of you, is 
how crucial that collaborative process is and the layering of having different people's involvement and what that, how that kind of really strengthens a project and brings so that something can have a certain tone as somebody else is coming in and, and kind of lacing a whole no, another level of, of tone on that, yes. which, um, which is no doubt why you're all sitting here. Um, uh, let's just come back to you guys, actually, f for a moment on that. And I mean, I'm really fascinated by what you were saying about how you wrote it as a essentially a kind of a full-on genre movie and how you felt about then your work being taken and, and, uh, um, and moved in a slightly different direction, in a great direction, but, but not necessarily how you'd orig originally envisioned it. Well, as we always say, if you're going to get rewritten by anybody, let it be Spike Lee yeah. and Kevin Wilmot, for that matter. Um, when we you know, came on board I mean, from the very beginning, we didn't know that you know, Trump mania was going to happen in 2016. Of course. We started, it was 2015 yeah. when we started it, and yeah, yeah. You know, Obama was in the White House. It was a very different landscape. When we did that rewrite based on Jordan Peele's notes, Trump mania was starting, so we kind of edged it in that direction. Uh, but then when Kevin and Spike came on board, they turned... There was Charlottesville. Yeah. yeah. And it was Spike's idea to you know, change the ending to account for all of that. Yeah. When we read the shooting script, we're like, wow, um, this is a Spike Lee movie now, right. which is what you want, yeah. you know. Um, and, and yeah, and it, that was all in there, uh, uh, what Spike and Kevin did. They took some of the things we were going for and just pushed it all the way. Mm. I mean, you were co-producers, am I right, on the film as yes, well? Correct. Yeah. I mean, it's, I just think it's fascinating that ha the, the sort of the push and pull of that co collaborative process and when you decide that to, to sort of allow the space for somebody else to move in and having to trust that. Completely. Um, but, you know, when we, well, first of all, when we started working on it, we joked that Spike Lee was going to direct it. It was just a dumb joke between us. Okay. Um, when we got the call that Spike was going to direct it, um, it was, I mean, it was crazy. It was completely wild. And uh, when we found out that he wanted to do a pass on the script, we're like, of course. Mm. One of the negative things about being a, a screenwriter in Hollywood is getting rewritten. But it's not negative when it's Spike Lee doing the rewriting. No, of course. And that, this, this is what's coming across with all of you, which is really interesting. It's, it's about working with the people who you know, they're just going to bring their vision to it. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think so. With a great yeah. director, which all these films have, a great very distinctive director who knows what they want and is shooting for something, then you, as a screenwriter, you're in, you're in good hands and you know where the train's going and everyone's, like, on it. So yeah. it feels like that's what you're serving is his, where he wants to go, or, you know, in this I'm, case. I suppose I'm interested how you, with, with your scripts, how, how you make sure that those people are going to see that in the script, that they're going to get excited, how those directors are going to read that script and get excited about what they can bring to it. Oh, well, in this case, I guess Yorgos was there the whole time. I mean, you two so, had been working with yeah. Yorgos already. Yeah, I mean, he was, you know, on it, and so yeah. the whole time. So it's different, I guess, from, probably similar to yours with Bradley, but different with Spike, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's a tough question to answer, because it, I'd say it's just, if you're anchoring things to the, to the truth about, you know, human behavior, and you're, you're, you're clear in who your characters are, then, whenever anyone comes on to rewrite you, you want to be able to explain yourself. Like I love being, getting notes. I used to hate it, but now I really like it because you need to be able to explain why every word is where it is. So if someone asks you, like, well, that, this doesn't sound like... So, there's a great um, David Chase line. It's, not, it's an apocryphal story, but he's on set, <clears throat> and somebody came up to him, and he said, um, you know, I don't think my character would say this. And he said, who said it's your character? <laughs> and, I mean, as a writer, if you're David Chase, you can say that on a film set or a TV set. But for us, when, we, when you're alone in the room with the page, you are in total control. And so you need to be, you know, if you're, if you're fisking yourself as you go, is this honest? Is this actually, like, you, you, I always say to young writers, like, decide who your characters are and don't change it. Like, you, people might not like your story. They might not like your, the people in it. But if you're changing as you go because you want to weave in a clever line you're going to lose them. So you're, you're trying to write something, and I didn't know Bradley Cooper was going to want to make a Star is Born. Literally nobody did. You know? So you just got to hope that the draft is saying something, and you're, you're trying to you, you have a clear understanding of who your characters are and what you're trying to say, and hopefully a director comes along who, who, wants to, who sees the story a similar way. 
So for you, Will, um, what was the biggest, I mean, what was your biggest challenge in the writing of that script? What were your problems? Oh, that's, a, that's, a really, that's a good question. Um, well, I was terrified to fail Bradley the whole time. And so that, that is a good and bad thing because I felt like I, like if Bradley Cooper says like, hey, I think we should go this direction. Um, you just, I, in the beginning I was just like, yeah, okay, let's do that. You know, and so it took me a little while to kind of get, and, and he, and he you know, pushed me to just like, you know, by the time we were done, you know, we, we worked together for a long time, but I was, I could, we could kind of stay, I wouldn't have no problem stopping him and saying, I don't think that's right. So that was a challenge just for me personally when I was writing it, is just treating, you know, Bradley like any other co-writer. Um, but I think th the hardest part for me was just the, the third act in general, because it was, it was very important to me that, you know, I've had that suicide in my, in my family. It's something that, um, you know, you, I did not want to be glib. In the other movies, it's very glib, you know, to be honest. I don't think people would really, it wasn't as much of a cultural issue. There's, there's the deaths of despair just like skyrocketing in, in America and I think everywhere. Um, so it was something I wanted to be in sure was like, Honest. So every and when you you and I the, the way he shot it and performed it, just like what state of mind a person's in in the day before they're going to take their own life, and then in the void in the aftermath, which that is the, that was the most difficult thing because in real life there's nothing to say. Well, you can't just have Sam Elliott sit there in silence. And I thought Bradley did a great job of actually showing the silence because he's just in silence and it's just Ramon sitting with her, and there's there's nothing to say. And then when Sam finally sits down, um, and you know, I, I just think his performance is so, that's my, like his performance is great throughout the film. He in that moment, because he looks like it's just, he's just spitballing, it's just coming to him, you know? And he's trying to think of anything to fill the silence. And um, so yeah, that was the most difficult, the third act was third the most act. difficult thing. Mm -hmm. Deborah, for you? Oh, well, we had, I think both of us had a, a very specific challenge, which is that we were focused on a female triangle. Mm -hmm. And that is not an easy thing to pull off. Um, and the shift between the three, whilst always keeping the concept of three characters up front, and not losing one of them. So that they're each as important as, as the other. Yes, I think that's right. I mean, as it happened for various reasons, um, Anne does emerge as sort of more of a lead character, but the concept was that it was a female mm. triangle, and that was the challenge. And I guess they're both there because of her. So it makes sense in a way that she is the, she's the person that they're both sort of swirling around in a way. Yes. Yeah. And, and for you, Tom? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, the hardest thing was probably the third act, as always. But, and because it's multi-protagonist, you know, you've got to end. Um, I think the hardest thing was, A, drifting. Like, it's a, it's a pretty funny film for a long time. And then it was, like, how to keep it, the tone in the third act. So we knew we were turning it tragic. But we didn't want to lose all the comedy completely. But we had to lose a bit of it. So that was a bit of a balance issue. And then just, just how to end the three stories was, was hard. And then the last scene was pretty hard and took us a while to work out how to do it economically with not too much dialogue and resist my desire to make things funny and um, find a way to use the rabbits, really. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that was hard. It's three, three protagonists is a hard thing to And why is deal it so? With. I mean, it, it'd be interesting if you just talk a little bit more about why it's so hard with three protagonists. I, th I think because you, you're, you've got to sort of... Well, it was sort of like in structuring the story, it was like that. You had to sort of structure the, the shifts between them so that you were constantly balancing back and forth. So there wasn't our main character, even though I sort of knew... We knew... We sort of knew Anne was becoming that because she was the catalyst, you know, because they were around her in a way. Um, so it's, it's, it, it, that was the most difficult part, was that kind of constructing a story that kept um, reversing and changing and changing your empathy for people and showing a different side of them and so that you couldn't, you know, Yorgos was very like, you know, we were very like, it's complicated. It's, they're complicated characters. No one's good, no one's bad. They behave badly, they behave, but they behave well, and, but they always behave driven from an understandable desire. And so it was just the shifts, cre creating the narrative that would allow a balanced 
you're always sort of shifting between one to the other, one's doing something to the other which always affected the other one and then at the end try to wrap it up, <laughs> really. That was sort of the most difficult. Okay. Um, and for you guys? I mean, working together, collaborating, was, was that an issue? Were you, but how did you work together in terms of the ri initial writing? Us two specifically? Yeah. Um, the way our process, process works is we outline, we do detailed outlines together. We sit down together in a room and outline. And Hopefully after at that, that point we've fought, you know, fought all our battles together and worked out. Conceptually. And, and yeah. argued and stuff. Knowing that we're making the same movie together. Right. And, and then, then right after that we divide it up. One person gets act two, one, uh, the other person gets acts one and three. Just rewrite each other. And basically. we swap. We swap okay. and, and we, we swap keep again. swapping until the voice is consistent. Okay. Until it blends, kind of like we're answering this question right now. Um, <laughs> but to answer your question about the biggest the challenge, challenge. Yeah. I think it was just being white and, and telling the story of a black detective. Okay. And um, the, the way that we solved that was including Ron in every step of the process. Mm -hmm. Having him, if not actually in the room, kind of feeling like he was in the room. Mm -hmm. Sending him every single draft, getting notes on every single page. And then of course we knew that it was going to be handed off to a black filmmaker. We just had no idea it was going to be Spike Lee. Spike Lee, yeah. 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 Okay, so I guess as we're, we're gonna have to wrap it up fairly soon, but um, I am interested in, in what you've all, because you've all been on a very, very long journey with these films. Um, what, what you've sort of taken away from that in terms of your working process and what, what you've kind of learned through that? It, uh, comparatively, it hasn't been very long for us. Okay, uh, yeah. 2015. It did move quite pretty quick, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> in contrast to the rest. Uh, so we expect that it's... Learn anything at all. That, no. <laughs> so that, all we know is it's, it's not always going to be <laughs> no, like no, this. We, we, just, yeah. we expect from now on every movie is going to be like this. Mm, okay. Uh, yeah. Is, that, is, that, is that the good lesson? I don't know, it's probably not the best lesson to take. Yeah. No, but seriously though, in terms of your working process and, 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 and the industry, and in terms of sort of your work within the industry and things that can support, I mean, I know you say like Spike Lee came on board and then obviously it was gonna take off. Um, you, you know, Charlie and I have only been full-time writers for about 15 months now, okay. so we're still learning. Okay. Um, I think maybe, one thing is it, it only takes one, the, the right project at the right time. Mm -hmm. uh, the right concept. Mm. And recognizing that, knowing when to recognize that it's gonna catch it, people's imagination. And just the hope that you know, if you write something that's well done, well crafted, that it can find its way into the hands of the right people. Yeah. And in our case, Jordan Peele, Spike Lee, Blumhouse, QC mm. Entertainment, Focus Features, it did just that. Mm. Right, so th there isn't any great wisdom that we could probably say, except maybe uh, for people who are trying to break in, we like to say, don't chase the agents, don't chase the managers, they're heat seeking. It's about uh, the work. It's, yeah. a, it's yeah, about yeah, yeah. the work and it's, it's kind of about getting it to the, to the producer. Yeah, finding the right collaborators. Finding the right yeah, collaborators, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Will? Uh, what did I learn? Um, well, it's underscored uh, the William Goldman quote, nobody knows anything. Um, but I really, I, I've taken, because well, what I go back to is the idea that, that you know, there was no point at which this felt like an obvious thing that would work, you know? And Bradley had And yet a, now it seems like it was. Yeah, I mean, people have a tendency, <laughs> we all have a tendency to do that. Like, you just go back and like, well, of course, you know? But like, I, Bradley doesn't look at the trades or the announcements, but I, I still was kind of tracking it. And it would be like, no, nobody was like, man, this one can't miss, you know? So. You just just being true to yourself, and that if you're going to take the if you're going to take that Goldman quote to its logical conclusion, if you really actually understand it, nobody knows anything, right? So all you have to offer in this business, in this world, everyone in this room, you have you have something unique to say. You don't get to decide whether or not the free market's going to give you money for it. You don't get to decide whether or not the director's going to come along and, and make it. But stay true to telling the stories that you want to tell, and if you do that. You know, you, you might not end up you know, rich and famous, but you'll end up satisfied with your work. And I spent a lot of time in the beginning of my career, and you guys are now walking right into it, which is if you're 
it, it's so, I can't even imagine where you guys come from right here, 15 months. So, like, oh man, I hope, I hope like, just because you, it's staying true to yourselves. Like, it, it, at the end of the day, they, they're, you're gonna, you, you get offered stuff and it gets pushed in your face. You write one script and then, like you said, the heat seeking thing, like, well, you did this, so you should do this. And, and then having the ability to stop and go, wait, I don't actually have anything to say about this. Or I'm only doing this because the producer, I loved this movie, or I, this actor I just love. Like, that's never the reason to write a story. And that's what I take away from it, is that ultimately I'm a storyteller, and not every movie or, or script that I write is gonna get made, but I ultimately have to write them the way I see them, and then and that's it. The rest of it I can't control. And Deborah? Well, I, I've got two things that I would say is, be contrary and be flexible. <laughs> And by that I mean, just do your own thing and every time someone says, no, that's not right, don't listen to them. Um, I remember when I first found this idea, people were saying to me, oh, it's definitely not a film, it's a novel. And I remember thinking, why are you more right than me? Why, why is your point of view the correct one? And I think that this, this quality of being completely contrary, which is what I am, has been a great strength to me over the years. And by flexible, I mean, don't expect that you come up with an idea and it's gonna go this way. Use the opportunities that come from whatever you're doing to find lots of different avenues and journeys. So when I was in a downtime and my idea was a script, but I hadn't found a producer, I had the opportunity to use that script to do an MA at the University of East Anglia. That gave me the opportunity to start writing radio dramas. I actually did a version of The Favourite for radio as a five-part series at the same time as I was writing the film script. So I'd say just stay very flexible, just keep Heat seeking all the opportunities that you can find. Uh, script writing covers very many media. Go for them all. Just keep trying and don't give up and don't stop believing that your point of view is probably the right one. Okay. Um, I would say I'm glad Deborah had that contrariness and flexibility <laughs> to keep going. Um, I'd say I learned two things, which I, someone said, what advice would you give to writers? And I'm like, work with a genius. <laughs> That's one. Um, and the second would be um, the, sort of the same thing. I mean, when, just make yourself happy. Like, make a film you want to watch, which is all... Because we were like, would anyone want to watch this? Because there was this sort of feeling of, like, it's a period film, but it's not really for people who like period films. Mm -hmm. So where we end up with no audience in that people who like period films won't like this movie and people who don't like period films won't even go to this movie. So, but at the same time, he was just like, well, I just want to do what I want to do. And actually, you got all of the audience. Yeah, and we were lucky because we got everyone. <laughs> you so got them all. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm afraid um, that we're out of time there, but this has been brilliant. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking David, Charlie, Will, Deborah and Tony.